Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this latest teaching session on technology and the future of medicine. Today is something we've never done before, and we're quite excited about it. It's a dialogue between younger person and older person. I think maybe the age difference is almost 50 years here, which is kind of cool. And um, so a perspective on ethics at the time of the singularity. So Earl Wah and Abdullah Salah, take it away. Great, well it's good to be here and I think, I hope, uh, by the end of the day you have a, a better grasp of some of the uh, highly technical ethical issues that we see that are going to be explored in um, the time when you experience singularity. I don't think I'll be there, but um, you will experience it. So. Um, what we hope to do is um, we have we put up a PowerPoint that has a number of issues that we can explore. We're not going to follow that PowerPoint religiously. It is in fact um, what you can see a an act, a three-act um, extravaganza. Um, and this uh, three-act extravaganza is going to be, um, the centerpiece of it is going to be a kind of dialogue between Abdullah and myself on uh, some of the issues that we see happening in singularity. Obviously, Abdullah has a different point of view, I would think, uh, with the age difference, but even apart from that is a uh, perspective, a completely different perspective because I come out of a discipline that is not uh, medicine, and in fact, I think that's a huge advantage with the, in the kind of course we have here. And uh, secondly, um, Abdullah is himself, uh, I think, uh, technologically more sophisticated than I am, and so uh, we, we've got both sides of the coin here. So. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Abdullah to give a, a brief introduction and then I will uh, talk about what we're going to do today. Thank you very much, Dr. Wall. So, um, <clears throat> like everybody here has already said, uh, my name is Abdullah Saleh. I um, guess I'm young. That's, that's the, the reason why I'm here. <laughs> but <laughs> And uh, my skin color projects well, I guess, in this life. But, um, the reason I think I've been asked to speak in this course on a few other occasions is because I have two roles really that I play. One is in my day-to-day -day job, which is as a surgical resident here at the U of A. And what that means is I'm training to become a surgeon, a general surgeon, and in all aspects, which deals with trauma, with oncology or cancer, and um, all the bread and butter surgical issues, as well as managing really sick patients and making sure that they go through it. There is a lot of ethical considerations that come with that on a day-to-day, -day, but there is more and more technologies that are being introduced into the surgical field. The other side of my life is really a bit different. It's I um, started doing development work uh, a number of years ago and over time have grown uh, uh, with a core group of people, an organization called Innovative Canadians for Change, or IC Change, and we've been doing development projects, particularly focused on introducing breakthrough innovations and breakthrough technologies to places that you wouldn't expect um, you know, to benefit from these interventions or to necessarily uh, be the right place for them. And so this innovation disruption, I, mean, I guess in a way I'm familiar with how technology and its impact can be both a positive and a negative, and we hope to use some of that. So I'll, I'll give it back to Dr. Wu to describe a little bit of, um, kind of set the context, kind of give the prologue of this whole, uh, of this whole lecture that we're going to be doing today. Great, Abdullah. Okay, so um, as you can see from the PowerPoint, we've really uh, divided this day into uh, three acts. Um, we have, of course, a, a prologue in which we're going to talk about some of the things that will change when singularity is in place. And, and that will uh, 
do a quick scan on some of the issues that we see arising out of uh, singularity. Then if, when we um, deal with the first act, we're going to try to explore a whole nest of issues that will arrive at the time of singularity. Now, um, right from the very beginning in Singularity's life, the ethical issue was a key issue. If you read uh, from Kurzweil on, uh, you can see that everybody who has been involved in this has, in one way or the other, uh, seen uh, ethics as a key issue and as a, um, not just a mild issue and not just a peripheral issue, but an issue that is front and center. The, the problem that is raised by that issue is then um, what we would call Act Two. And in Act Two, we're going to look at uh, what is going to happen to the human in singularity. What kinds of issues are going to be raised at that time for the human? And are we going to be able to define the human in any way and shape or form that, that puts it in the same kind of ken as what we live in. In other words, uh, your understanding of what you are as a human and the issues that that raises for you now may indeed not have a bearing on singularity when we are incorporated into machinery and um, uh, computers and other kinds of things may regulate everyday life to a degree far beyond what it is today. Act three then is for us um, what we would call the dialogue section. That's the debating section. And what, what we uh, plan on doing there is to point out some of the real issues that arise out of singularity. And those real issues are not something, I think, that are um, to be swept under the rug. In effect, um, there are a number of people who want to address those issues now because they see it's important on the acceptance of singularity in the future. So the role of singularity is uh, both a magnet towards which technology is leaning it is also a problematic era in which several key aspects of who we are and what we are uh, will be raised and we have to deal with that issue and you as students are the ones that could wrestle with those issues and probably will have to wrestle with them when as the closer the singularity comes about. And then in Act 3, it's your game. And you can uh, raise any issue that you find. Perhaps there's an issue in your research or your reading that you think you want to take and to discuss. We will try to make sure that you have time to, uh, to bring that issue to the floor and either a fellow student or Kim or uh, Abdullah or I, you can address all three of us and we will try to have uh, whatever um, intellectual discussion we're able to bring to that issue. Okay, is that fair enough? And we'll uh, spend the next uh, hour and 20 minutes or so um, going through those three acts. Okay, so let me turn it over. Uh, do you want to talk uh, any further about that? Okay. okay. All right, so let's go to the prologue and let's uh, look at some of those things that we see as critical. One of the huge issues is and you can see it today. And if you compare a classroom today with um, a classroom back when Abdullah started, you, you wouldn't see computers in a class then. Nor, nor would you expect in a class, even a class uh, in science, for computers to be available for everybody. So one of the critical problems is that more than half the world does not have the tools that you have in front of you. And the amount of money that would be required to make everybody uh, participate in this technological miracle that we're talking about is astronomical. It'll move the whole um, issue about uh, inequality to another level. 
And if you have to have a computer in order to be able to carry on a dialogue in, uh, in Singularity, you can see the huge, incredible amount of money that we have to invest in the next 40 or 50 years. Another issue, of course, is that we haven't even addressed some of the most critical ethical issues of our time. It obviously is not a political statement to say that the slums have not disappeared from Edmonton, from Calgary, from Vancouver, from Toronto. And in fact, if you have traveled around the world, you could find um, very often that one of your first encounters after you get out of the airport in most major cities in this world is slums. And if you go to Africa, you could, you could see people who, who, if they had three square meals a day, would think they had died and gone to heaven. This is the world that we live in. And if we are going to be serious about technology, then one of the issues that we have to wrestle with is, can we use this technology to feed people in slum areas in the world. What do we do with the whole issue of, of inequality? I saw a stunning report the other day. 85 people in this world, 85 people control half the world's finances. That's a stunning thing to know. Because that means if this continues that we are going to face not only inequality in slums, but we're going to face the majority of us, including you, as, as part of the have-nots. And there is no international organization that can control the use of that money or where that money goes. From my perspective, this is a shocking thing. And from my perspective, it is one of the most evil things that my generation has done. Because that means then that we have set up organizations and structures that has, in effect, denied our fellow humans uh, the same kind of opportunities that only 85 people in this world have been able to, to get a hold of it, to utilize. There are other issues that, that we could bring about in such a prologue and some things that you might want to think about. Who is going to have technology? We, we have not yet decided who that will be. After all, you're in university. What about, uh, Kim, do you know, is it about 10% of Alberta students uh, in university? Probably. Yeah, about 10%. So you may have technology, but you know, there's an awful lot of people out there that don't have it. Do you have any responsibility because of that? Are there ethics of supply and demand that you control, that people, you know, ordinary Joes that you went to high school with, will never have? Oh, they may, they may uh, buy a, a Ford truck and a tractor hat, but apart from that, are they going to have the kind of technology that will lead them into a, a new kind of perspective on life and open up to them the whole possibility of uh, technology. So, uh, technology is another uh, kind of thing and we haven't developed what I would call a common attitude towards technology. So, finally, I think, uh, another issue, and these are huge issues, is the impact of nanotechnology and artificial intelligence. Now, um, Osmar has made his first 
his first presentation to you. And um, I like his stuff. Um, but the interesting thing to me is that buried, you know, in the footnotes are, are thousands of, of issues. Artificial intelligence then raises more issues than it solves, in effect, for us. And uh, one of the real problems then with AI is precisely its incredible ability to change the game without the rules of the game being spelled out for us. And the same with nanotechnology. I, I just picked up popular mechanics. This morning I was suffering in the dentist's office, right? And so I picked up popular mechanics. And popular mechanics had a full page spread in there on what they thought was the most, one of the most extraordinary things that had been discovered. Um, and it was an artificial um, strengthener for your arm. So, for example, if, if you uh, had an arm that was weak in some way, shape, or form, they have now an, an artificial limb that can go over your arm and will give you um, extraordinary power. Um, I can see a picture in the, uh, <laughs> in the uh, baseball, uh, you know, picking up one of these things and, and throwing things about 200 miles an hour. I don't, I don't know what the top speed is now, but it's a little, it's about 100 miles an hour. So, in effect then, we have the, the possibility of outfitting people who are weak in some area of their body. And it's for a rather cheap price of, of $15,000. Well, um, who can afford that, you know, in Nigeria? Um, who, who can afford that um, in some areas of Vietnam? Who, who can afford that in Tibet? Who's going to have these things? Who's going to pay for them? So the potential for all kinds of issues on, from nanotechnology are present there. Well, uh, those are some of the naughty issues that we're going to try to, to explore today, okay? I don't say we're going to solve any of them, <laughs> but we're going to give it a, you know, we're going to give it a try. So, I'll we'll turn it over to you. I'm not sure how, because um, we, we haven't done this before, and, and I think there might be value in trying to build a little bit of a back and forth um, and then for you guys to then join in the back and forth. It's not sides, it's, it's more in exploring ethics, it's not that we're picking sides, it's just that we're getting deeper and trying to critically appraise an issue. So, Dr. Wolf, you brought up a few points. Um, I mean, let's, maybe we'll explore one and then kind of build back from that. Um, so the, the issue or the this technology, an exoskeleton to strengthen somebody who uh, may have um, superhuman strength as a technology, or can be seen as a, an aid to overcome a disability uh, in somebody who's either lost an arm or has some kind of palsy or something that now they can't use this arm. And so would that then overcome the, the price barrier and say, well, the cost of providing this to that individual um, is really negligible when it comes to the productivity gain by, by doing this, uh, by paying into that. And if, if we look at the disability across the world and the, uh, the burden of disability from surgical and, and uh, traumatic diseases, then interventions like that could potentially, uh, you know, give somebody a leg up to get out of a slum situation or out of poverty when otherwise they wouldn't be able to. But this idea of singularity, it's, it's, it seems like it's a topic that it takes something into, it, it proposes something, that what if machines could think or be as intelligent as we are or exceed us, just at the verge of exceeding us, there lies the singularity because now we can no longer comprehend the consequences of what's going to happen. But 
if we're projecting that if that's going to happen, and some people say it's not going to happen for a lot of reasons, or some people say that it will happen but not in the way we imagine it, then what kind of world are we going to be in in that time? So if we have more and more people living in the world and more and more people coming to live in cities, are we then really thinking about the world in the same way that we think about it now with kind of some people in the rural areas and more, some people in the cities, or is everybody going to be here living in cities with such high population density that our idea of a technology introduced after the singularity like a robot may not be the same thing that we're conceptualizing now. And we'll get a little bit more into that as, as we go into it. I know it seems abstract, but um, let's, let's try to explore it. So, what if technology is not a physical thing? Let's say that technology is a set of code, for example. Let's say it's, it's programming. And we're going to, um, let's use, for example, a social network as a form of technology. Now, is, is this an opportunity or a threat for us? And I think that's what we're trying to, to explore, is that are we giving up too much by, you know, in a way, giving information into a network that we're consciously feeding by putting up photos, by putting up our emotions, putting up, or at least a digital version of our emotions, and um, describing where we are. And pretty soon this thing starts to get predictive abilities. So all of you, I'm sure, have some encounter where your popular searches come back to haunt you, where you might on Facebook have something, you, pop, you accessed a website somewhere, and now suddenly they're suggesting all kinds of things rel relevant to that. I work in East Africa, and I get all kinds of ads about East Africa. Or we set up ceramic water filters, and now for some reason I get all the ads about ceramic toilets coming out of China. I think they missed the point and, <laughs> and I think <laughs> which, which now starts to, to look at um, refining this. So it's, it's gauging. Am I neglecting or am I consciously saying I'm not into toilets, I'm into porous ceramics for water filtration. So the system starts to learn and it starts to predict my behavior. And while that may not be intelligence, but it's pa pattern recognition, which is a very primitive version of an artificial intelligence for me. So now, are we giving this up consciously, or do we not really understand that most of our actions, and most of us here, when we use Google uh, directions, you know, Google Maps and any kind of direction technology, it's mapping out where we go, and it's mapping out where we frequent and where maybe the computer starts to suggest you should buy this because it's near where you frequent. So if we're giving it up, are we really thinking about the consequences of what that means? And if there is an event like the singularity, are we going to be in a position where we've kind of put all our cards on the table and we don't necessarily right now have the capacity to understand what that means. But that being said, let's look at an example of, um, we talked about slums, so let's talk about slums. I work in a slum, uh, well, primarily in one slum uh, in Kenya called Kibera. And it's, I'm sure you guys have heard of that place, it's a very densely populated slum. Some people estimate about 35,000 people living per square kilometer in that area. Now, I don't think we can comprehend what that really is like until you've been there and you see that there are six people in a room smaller than this little corral where we're sitting. They can't sleep at the same time, so they take shifts. So some people work during the day, some people work during the night. There's no toilet facility, so they go and go to the bathrooms outside. They might not have, they might not want to defecate right outside their house, so they do it in a plastic bag. And what do they do with the plastic bag? Because there's no facilities to dispose of them, they throw them somewhere. So you have this, you know, pollution because of population density, because of urbanization, because of increasing human population. But if you look at these guys' as priority, and you understand that they are a network 
of people that need a certain number of interactions to be able to survive. You cannot fault them for wanting to be connected to one another because that ensures their livelihood. So for them, they will preferentially, and this is from my experience, preferentially buy credit for their cell phone rather than food or rather than medicine. Because communication and telecommunication affords them opportunities and they're putting themselves willingly, although their backs are up against the wall, into this network, are sharing more information than they maybe should, but they're doing that to survive. And so, if this is the, the world that really will be the norm, unfortunately, by 2045 or 2050, then I think we're doing ourselves a disservice by not asking these questions soon enough and exploring them not in a hypothetical context, but in a context of a very densely populated world where we have scarcity and we have overpopulation pushing us to make choices and rely on technology, often um, unjustly uh, making ends you know, meet one way or another. And speaking of justice, are we saying that we as humans are more just if we're saying that, like you brought up the point that your generation's biggest mistake might have been the, um, an inequitable distribution of wealth to 85 people, the top 0.01% or 0.001% um, against the rest of the population. And some would say that a computer evaluating that from an ethical stance where we define the ethics as whatever be you know whatever we want it to be might say that that is a completely unacceptable and ethical world that we live in and maybe they would suggest a different type of justice that might be more beneficial for us maybe we are our moral judgment is flawed so Should we pause? Because I feel like you should keep, like, should I, should, I, I, should think you should, I think you should uh, okay, <laughs> destroy so my argument. One of, the, one of the critical problems that I see coming down the pike of singularity is um, intentionality and, um, and motivation. Um, I see it now. I, I see it in students. I see it in colleagues. Um, when you ask them a question, they defer to the computer. You know, they say, well, you know, I have to go online to find an answer to that. Why? You know, I mean, does more information give you a better judgment? Perhaps, but I don't necessarily think so. Moreover, I, I'm worried about, you know, baseball players with, you know, arms that can throw 200 miles an hour uh, becoming the norm and, and therefore the intentionality of, of ordinary people is, is lost in the shuffle. What, I, what concerns me greatly about singularity is the, the possibility that, that machines will be so good that we will give up all of our uh, you know, effort and I think what makes humans great is when they face an incredible problem, they, they master it on their own. They find a way to make it work. They do it, they, they put their heart and soul into it. And I think this is one of the key issues about what makes humans great. If you've got a machine, you defer to the machine, and so you sit back and say, well, the machine didn't tell me what to do, so I won't bother doing it. I think um, there is an element to mastery of, of what you were saying that I think we're definitely losing. And we're, um, there was a time, and I think that's kind of maybe peaked and now it's starting to get down again, is when we worked on our hardware, where we made our machine as efficient and as flexible and we understood things and took time to digest things and uploaded whatever software it was, so new knowledge, but we could process it and critically appraise it. And nowadays maybe we just 
are too superficial in our understanding because we're like, well, the wealth of knowledge exists on a server somewhere, I just have to know how to find it. I know in medicine that's definitely uh, becoming more and more true. All of us rely on uh, our phones and our PDAs and our uh, smartphones and everything to make decisions um, or to access uh, you know, the latest guidelines, for example, for managing something or something else. But some would say, so what? You're doing better now. And in the field that I'm in right now, and one of the reasons I went into it, is this, it's surgery, I know we, we have up there, well, what if robots could operate on people? But conceptually, I cannot begin to understand how, uh, you know, it's, it's a very difficult uh, skill to be able to do technically. But the technical skill is the least um, you know, difficult thing about surgery, but it's the decision making, the value judgment that we make, and the be, being able to weigh risk benefit in a way that um, is very hard to quantify, which makes evidence based medicine in surgery this very elusive thing. And we all ac accept that surgery doesn't have the same evidence based uh, medicine as, for example, internal medicine. But at the same time, internal medicine sometimes can get paralyzed by how much information they faced yes. to the point that now they're just doing, uh, well, are they equivalent medications or is there no harm to this new medication? Which comes with a whole series of ethical problems that, yes. that are different. But So I, I agree with you that there is definitely this loss of inten intentionality but also superficiality. But the robots that I think, you know, we, or the maybe not robots, maybe the artificial intelligence or the technologies that we're talking about are we saying that they're going to be making, um, you know, judgments on these things? And is that what we are going to be giving up? Or would, um, you know, we brought up the loss of jobs in, pre in a previous conversation of Foxconn, um, you know, in China with, um, you know, automating their factories. Now this many, 1.2 million people have lost their jobs. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, robots now are doing them. But are those jobs that, should, that people should be doing or, you know, with half the world being like these are human rights violations, they shouldn't be working there, they're children, they shouldn't be doing that and all that. Or should we be using our creativity uh, to do something more and have the robots take care of the automatic kind of processes? What do you think? Well, I, <laughs> I, I could answer that easily if I had any confidence that, you know, the CEOs of companies like Apple and, and Google and others had, had, you know, widespread commitment to, uh, to address the disparities that this, uh, that Foxconn is uh, causing. Um, um, and, and just after this announcement about 1 to 1.2 million we're going to be replaced by robots. You know, um, Google decided that they were going to use Foxconn and all their uh, stuff too. I mean, uh, and there was no, uh, nothing put in place to handle the people who were thrown out of work. And, and I, I've been to China and I, <laughs> I, I know what happens to those people. I mean, you, you can see, you know, little women, you know, uh, trudging into work early in the morning and then coming out and, and, and the money that they bring home is a pittance, but it feeds, you know, two or three people. And, and so if you've got a guy sitting someplace, God knows where in the world, saying, well, you know, let's get rid of these people and, and we'll, we'll put all this in, I, I find that very, very difficult to take. And um, obviously, I, I don't think that you can trust businesses who rely on machines to make business decisions to have any kind of really ethical concern about the human. And if that's the norm now in business, God help us when singularity comes. From my perspective then, uh, what's going on in this kind of situation bodes ill for singularity. I wish I could have confidence that when we have a machine that is twice as smart as I am, 
it will have programmed into, you know, it's uh, a logarithm, you know, the fact that it's going to be morally aware and morally sensitive to, to the humans. But if we've got a situation like this in this world, where we have, after all, a, an ethical voice that can be raised, um, and it's not raised, and it's not, it doesn't have any kind of impact on, on what we would call uh, management uh, directives, then God help us when we get to singularity and we have machines that say, well, you know, there's a whole population here that really are not very productive. So, you know, let's pull them and uh, put robots in. Uh, the other issue that I want to bring um, about uh, this whole uh, possibility of moral understanding is this. Um, moral understanding can be blunted. It can be blunted by a number of things. It can be, obviously it can be blunted by finance. It can be blunted by power, as we, as we can see in the world today. Um, so, uh, while it is true that singularity says that the human that will exist at that time has no particular relationship to the, the human that we have now, I wish I could have confidence that the human that will exist then will insist upon a moral world to live in, that, that people who are poor will not be eliminated, and that people who have no power within a a, a, a political and or, or organizational structure will, will find a place. That if I had confidence in that, I, I might take a, a different tack on the whole singularity uh, potential. But from my perspective, um, I don't see that happening today. And so I don't, I don't see it happening when machines, in fact, can tell us, well, there is a better way to take care of all these people who don't have enough food. And, and uh, the, for me, what will be critical will be who writes the program and who decides what will go into that program and will it have an ethical content. I, I don't see uh, from the, the material that I've read that the ethical content is uh, any higher than it is in, in the business environment today. So, so that raises some concerns for me. I want to go back to what I talked about a moment ago. When I was a kid, um, I used to build soapboxes. Did anybody here build soapboxes? Did you build a soapbox? Did you build one, Kim? Yeah. I, I built soapboxes. Did you build one? You didn't? Well, you're missing out on a lot, man. I mean, a soapbox was really cool. So for the longest time, I only had three wheels. Yeah? Have you ever tried to make a soapbox with three wheels? It's tough, you know, because you have to work on the front, you know, to, to make that front wheel sit properly. And, to, and I only had wood to work with, right? And a hammer and nails. You know, I was about eight or nine. I made soapbox after soapbox after soapbox. My father said to me when I got into high school, he said, you know, you have a lot of engineering ability. He said, you know, I, some of those soapboxes you made were really quite clever. So he said, I could see you, you know, making Ford cars and, you know, constructing new kinds of materials and whatnot. And when it came for me to go to university, he said, you know what, I will, uh, I'll pay for you to go into engineering. I said, no, I won't go into engineering. You know why? It's too easy. It's too easy. It's formulaic, right? You just follow the formula, right? I mean, you see all the new cars that are coming out and you think, oh, there must be a genius behind that. That's Balderdash. You know very well it's a computer program that just designs that new car and, you know, it's formulaic. You put it into the machine and out it comes. 
I said to my father, that's too, that's too easy. You know, I, I'm going to go into arts. I'm going to study philosophy. I'm going to look into, you know, many different kinds of religions and many different kinds of cultures. I'm going to try to figure out what it is that makes humans tick. That's, for me, really tough. That's, that's a tough thing to handle. Engineering, then, is not what I will go into. And he wouldn't give me the money. So you know what? I bloody well did it anyway. So will generations in singularity have that kind of guts? You know, will they say, I don't care what the machine says. Will it, will it say, you know, I'm going to build this, I'm going to construct this, I'm going to write this, I'm going to do that. Will people still have that kind of intellectual fortitude and, and intestinal guts to say, you know, I don't care what the world does. What makes people great is that they do something different. So if the machine says, oh, no, no, you, you shouldn't do that. Are we developing a whole generation of people that will just take the machine to tell them what to do? God help us. What do you say to that? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So... Carry on. I wanted to hear what you say about life and death decisions, robots deciding what they're going to operate on. Well, but but why should they? I mean, why is it that we assume that the robots will immediately become the masters and we're subservient to them? If, um, if that's that's the that's the fear, but it might not turn out that way if we take the necessary steps now. So why did we not get wiped out by, with nuclear war when the technology behind you know, fission first came out and then subsequently fusion? And now fusion is very intensely researched but very regulated. Fission and nuclear reactors and all that have a huge potential to annihilate everybody, but there are mechanisms in place that are regulating that. And so I think that we continuously are racing to, to our own demise, and we just are either stupid enough that we don't even realize it and somehow avoid it, or there is just enough balance in this that it, there, there is an element of regulation that we're introducing and it's just part of our apprehension to think. When, when you said, well, the world is, uh, the business as an entity is this unjust thing that's allowing these people to lose their job. Well, it's, it's people who are allowing people to lose their job. And it's people that are doing things that are, <laughs> you know, just really, and ethical things around the world and killing each other and waging wars and population control through wars and genocides and all the things that happen that are too horrible to even contemplate unless you've lived through. And when you have and you understand that, unfortunately, we don't have the moral fortitude to be able to be aware on a big enough scale beyond our own immediate, unfortunately selfish needs to build to, for the future. The world survives not because of us, it survives despite us. And I think that's, that's the, <laughs> the issue that I think we're um, maybe not on the same page on. That I think the, the machines or the artificial intelligence might become a scapegoat and they might wipe us all off, but really it's our own doing. And so, if we now start to grow this idea um, of, um, no, okay, we're gonna, okay, good, now, now we're gonna get into it. <laughs> and, 
And I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm being a little bit facetious about certain points to get a bit of a discussion, kind of more heated discussion, but I think there, there is, I understand humanity and understand morality and understand ethics, but there is, uh, it is done so poorly right now. Um, and I think the people that continue to help us regulate ourselves are probably the people and the mechanisms that will help create mechanisms to regulate this new technology and, and uh, new things in place. I'll, I'll tell a little bit of that story that, that we both know about. Philip K. Dick wrote this short story and it's called The Defenders. And it's, it's about when the... Uh, it's, it's, it was written in the 60s when the Cold War was kind of in full force and people um, were afraid that there was going to be, you know, um, a, a nuclear war that would annihilate everybody. And everybody would talk, would quote these things that there's enough nuclear weapons to wipe out the world seven times over. So Philip K. Dick wrote a story about how we continue to advance our technological, um, um, you know, uh, weapons to the point that robots were fighting the wars for us. So you had American robots fighting Soviet robots. And the whole of humanity went underground. And they would just get reports from the robots about how the world was doing. And so one day they realized that there's something fishy going on. The robots' reports don't make sense. So the humans decide to force their way out of the tunnels and go explore to see what's going on. The robots kept telling them the world is a nuclear wasteland. You cannot live in it. You cannot survive. They decide to put on lead suits and go up to the surface. When they go up, they find that the world is in perfect shape. It's been you know, fully taken care of, all the lawns have been cared for, all the houses have been cleaned, everything has been maintained and advanced, and the robots have just, immediately when the humans went underground, they've just stopped the war, because they're like, what are we doing? And they just decided to wave out humanity to grow enough to get into uh, the moral growth to be able to stop the war on their own. Oh, such belief of youth. Um, the, the fact of the matter is that um, you have to have an awful lot of faith. First of all, to believe that machines are going to be more honest than humans in singularity, and that machines once you program it into, uh, into that machine, and then that machine begins to move up away beyond human understanding of things, you have to have an incredible belief that the machine is going to do what's right. You, don't you see that this is another religion? I mean, it's just like, well, God is not going to let us destroy ourselves. Huh? Why not? I mean, this is another religion, you know, um, the machine is always going to do what is positive, is always going to do what's best, but for whom, right? It's going to do it for the machine. So in effect, once we abdicate our role as controlling the world, once we abdicate our responsibility for defining things ethically, once we say, I'm sorry, but I don't know how to do this, we're dead. I fear for your career. Yeah, almost to God. First of all, because, you know, we've got a machine now that can land the airplane. You know, when you go through a whole forest of clouds and you think, how in the world is that guy ever going to see where the, you know, where he's landing? Of course it's nice when you're sitting back there to say, well, you know, there's a machine that's going to put us on the ground anyway and we can't see anything. How long is it going to be before your patients are going to say, look, I, I just don't trust that you can be as good as a machine, right? And, and all you have to do is tell the machine to take this tumor out of my head. That's all you have to do. And the machine has 
micro skills to take, you know, that, the tiniest bit of that tumor out so that the cancer is gone. So I, I'd sooner have the machine take the tumor out of my head to Abdullah. Okay? So 40 years from now, you might be starving. You might be out of a job. But, so right now, today, there is 2 billion people, and yeah. 2 billion people that don't have access to a surgeon. And if I'm waiting to protect <laughs> my career, and meanwhile, these people don't have access to somebody who can take out a very preventable cancer and die horrific deaths. And this is things that I've seen. Breast cancer eating somebody's chest until it eats at their aorta and they bleed to death. That, to me, that is, that is where the unethical practice is. Touche. Touche. <laughs> so what, what I think is we need the students to be a part of this. So I don't know what you think about NSA, but I don't think much of it. I, I think this uh, surveillance thing undercuts your rights in a major way. And I, I just looked up in Financial Times today, and Verizon, can you believe this? Verizon was approached for 320,000 people in the United States from the FBI to get information about them. 320,000 people. The potential of all of these organizations to, to sneak into your life is like major. So, you know, the, the number of drones that are up in the sky that are spying on us now is amazing. You know, something like 30,000 of them already are wandering around North America. I mean, God help us, 50 years from now, the whole sky will be full of spies. See, uh, from my perspective, uh, the ethical imperative is being lost, and I'm concerned about the future of you and your grandchildren uh, because I think this raises humongous problems. Humongous problems. And do you know that the NSA doesn't have to have a letter of approval, does not have to tell anybody why they want to find out everything about you. They don't have to ask a judge. They don't have to ask the president. All they have to do is get their superior to sign for it. What a travesty. What an outrage. That some pontificate sitting behind a desk can sign the, f the fact that everything about me is going to be downloaded onto a disk and somebody is going to look into it. My God, I think I better go back to when I was a kid again. So why do, why do we have the uh, students ask questions? Whoever wants to, wherever. You answer. You answer. So my question then becomes whose role it is to make sure that the rights of those who don't have access to this sort of information um, who, whose role is it? It's okay. Um, whose role is it to monitor the companies that are monitoring us? I mean, what we're talking about is an activism of sorts to make sure that people who have access to information are protecting the rights of people who don't have access to that same information. I mean, you know about the NSA's role. We now all know about it, but. At a point in time, no one knew about it. You had to have one reporter who went on the fly, and that reporter is facing serious consequences. So whose job is it? That's my question for everyone here. Whose job is it to make sure that these things... So um, I, I, I think basically her question is, who's supposed to watch the watchers? You know, if uh, Edward uh, Snowden hadn't, hadn't existed, was it somebody else's job to... to bring this, this information to us. You have the thing. Okay. 
Maybe let me let me answer with a different topic that relates to it, and then answer that quickly. Um, let's look at electronic medical records. You walk into a doctor's office, and you want them to know your medical history, especially when you've been hit by a car and um, you can't talk for yourself. You want them to be able to identify you and have that information. So you give that information willingly, or at least if you, if you understand how the Canada Health Act works and the collection of information and the Freedom of Information and Privacy Act for health information works, you are, um, the data is yours. It's your information to access. It's the government's or information to own. And it's the physician's um, right to collect. And it leads to a, an imperfect system where, because of need, you accept that some, that will collect information that is sensitive on all of you. So this morning on my drive back from one of the hospitals, um, I heard the Minister of Health was outraged <laughs> that one of the computers from our wonderful Alberta Health Services was stolen with 600,000 people's uh, um, medical records or some medical record information, okay? So does that mean that we shouldn't have been collecting that information or does that mean that it should have been better secured or does that mean that we should have kept it in paper form hidden somewhere or that we should never have collected in the first place? That you come in every time just like, who are you? And let's start fresh. So now you build from that, and let's, um, uh, let's look at who's collecting the NSA's information, or whatever CSIS, or our equivalent here, who's, who, who are collecting information. And I traveled to the US, and I was born in Iraq, and I've traveled in all kinds of fun places that look very questionable on a passport, that I have an incredible time with NSA people every time I go to <laughs> whatever country it is that I happen to go to. So, uh, so I, I don't have a clear answer for you, but it's it, these imperatives to collect that information steps outside of, uh, they make themselves beyond laws and beyond ethics because if, if, if you say, well, it has to be regulated by this, then they just make deeper um, you know, more hidden tracks that you just don't know. So what Snowden unveiled is nice, but things have changed and now it's a different system that we all know about until the next Snowden comes and releases it. Dr. Wall, what do you think? So in the slides, you have some pros and cons from various writers. What I think is we need a whole cadre of people like yourselves who are going to write on this topic and who are going to do research and who are going to um, propose uh, solutions to some of these problems. In my view, singularity will never happen without that. I think the dangers are too great, and I think without a Snowden and uh, a cadre of people to spend some time doing that, I think we are uh, opening the Pandora's box and we don't know what's in Pandora's box. So. Um, my, my perspective on this is that until we have people who are able to, um, to write from the perspective of what's wrong with uh, the unlimited access to information like this, until we have the situation in place that, perf that, uh, that at least says that humans must be protected from the use of organ by uh, the use of this information for organizations by organizations and others until that's in place then i am not in favor of uh many of the things that we have available i i think um we just have an example here of tenil right this uh, uh aboriginal girl who who uh, put on a a sweater that says you know you know, um, it's the tree, it's uh, because of the Indians. Do you have land today? It's because of the Indians. And so uh, this brought her such a horrendous outpouring on her Facebook account that they had to shut it down. 
So each of you with Facebook has got the same problem. You know, there's, there's information in there that nobody knows where it goes. Well, we know where it goes. So the, the bottom line is that we don't have the safeguards in place for humans at this point in time with the kind of technology that we have. And we need a cadre of people who are going to research that and who are going to tell us what to do. That's my perspective on this. Kim, do you want to say anything about that? Well, I, I was intrigued this week. I don't know if any of the rest of you noticed this. Uh, Carl uh, Honoré, who's written a book in praise of slowness, uh, was here on this uh, campus talking about his book. None of you were there. How do I know that? There was no one there under the age of about 35. It was fascinating that somehow... <laughs> Angus was there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no. And it, it was very scary in its own way. It's sort of the opposite side of this. What he was saying is if you're in a discipline where students are already publishing papers, there's something wrong. That never used to happen. Students didn't have to publish papers before. If you're in a discipline where students are publishing papers, slow down. Whoa, that's bad. That's really bad. How many people have published a mediocre paper because you had to publish a paper? All these hands go up. But he doesn't ask the right questions. That in modern life, I mean, it's true, people publish mediocre papers, but people can publish videos. They can get academic credit for videos, for blogs, all sorts of multimedia things that a Angus and I are quite keen on. That counts now. It, 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 it moves you forward. There's a student in this class who put a video online got an, a, a very impressive job offer a few days later. That never would have ha happened in the past. So the world is moving forward. It, it's neither good nor bad. It's, it's just the way, way it is. There are bad <laughs> things out there. There are lots of ethical questions we don't have uh, an answer for. But may, maybe one thing to... to to end with here, we're with one minute left. If uh, Osmer Zayan were here, he might say what he has said in, in, in this room many times before. We can build robots that are better at ethics than uh, human beings are. And with, with deeper, broader, capabilities, and the movie, Her, kind of gives you that same idea. If a, a machine can be a better friend for a human being than other human beings, then it would follow that, that probably a, a machine could also be more de deeply humanly ethical. We don't know that that's possible, but you've already heard a lecture from uh, uh, Osmer, and he believes that that possibility is at wor least worth considering. So the spectrum of po possible futures here includes the most horrendous, terrible, dysphoric outcomes you can possibly imagine beyond your worst nightmares, but it also equally includes things on the other side, a world in which you can have whatever you want the barriers to uh, happiness you experience every day today are no longer there. Everything that prevents you from complete self-actualization is gone, and you can be the person you really want to be. Uh, virtual reality is better than real reality. Virtual reality can be experienced with friends and associates, you know. So that, there's that whole spectrum. And, ladies and gentlemen, we have some capability to figure out where we end up, and that's part of the reason for this course, that we, we, we can en end up in a horrendous, worse than any description of hell, 
it, it, they, they, the future can be awful, can be not worth living for anyone on earth, or the opposite could also be true. And hopefully in this course, we'll, we'll, we'll end up with, with some clues of how to shape things in a positive uh, direction. Well, today has been very much an experiment in, in many ways, and, and, and thanks to all, all of you for uh, living through the challenges of this. But uh, the next time we, we, we do it, it'll be more smoothly oiled and uh, really slick. But sometimes the first time of, of doing something has a real charm, and I was certainly charmed by both of you. <laughs> Don't put it on. <laughs> He's trying to butter us up. <laughs> he wants us back. Yeah, that's what he wants. <laughs> yeah I, I do want them back. I, I think it's a wonderfully diverse uh, perspective. Okay, well, thank you very much, and we'll see you on Tuesday.